will talk about profiling and tracing and how it is made a bit easier with XProf. So a few words about myself. I started using Erlang about 10 years ago. I'm working at Appliscale, which is a consultancy company based in Krakow, Poland, specializing in, in large scale and low latency or soft rate time systems. And also another focus is DevOps and cloud engineering. We have several AWS certified engineers in our team. So what is XProf? It's a library, an open source, uh, production safe, real-time visual profiler for Erlang and Elixir. It was uh, started two years ago by Mihal Nietz and now the core team also consists of my colleagues Pavel Pikula, Wojciech Gawronski and myself. So production safety. So Elixir from the beginning uh, was focused on like easy to learn and start and very good development tools but now it's getting mature more and more products are uh, more and more yeah products are going into production li live with more and more traffic more and more load and we also need tooling to handle observe and debug these systems and xprof is just one addition to these tools or tries to be it's a single function profiler that means it's between regular profilers and debugging tools so because uh, so regular profilers usually measure all the functions in your system like in a back box and then you can just spit out like the five slowest ones whereas xprof just uh, measures one or a few functions that you select so it's a bit similar to debugging just without the fact that you cannot just stop the word in a production system and then look at the variable bindings so you need other means so the motivation why this uh, XProf was created, we actually have the actual performance problems in the live system that we were working on two years ago. Uh, and uh, we, we had some metrics, uh, instrumented code in our monitoring system. We measured some parts of the system, but they were not fine-grained enough. So we needed more metrics, but we didn't want to go through the deployment process, wait one week for one extra metric. So we needed something that uh, enables ad hoc measuring and measuring any function that we like immediately. We looked at profiling tools like FProf, which, uh, as I said, it measures all the functions in the system. And with that, it gives so much overhead that it's basically unusable, unusable in a in a loaded system, it just brings it down to its T's. And also, because of this, it uh, adds distortion to the measurements. Also, it only uh, gathers call count and average duration of the functions. And we needed more details, like some kind of distribution of the durations, like high percentiles and maximum values. And also more details in the sense that at least so for some function calls, we wanted to see the actual arguments and return value so we can have a closer look. And uh, FROF, how it works is you measure for a given time and then it analyzes the gathered data and then it spits out the result. But we wanted to see the results continuously, like in a monitoring system, so updated every second. And also the result that FROF uh, creates is like a huge elixir term which is very hard to digest or see what where so we wanted to create some more intuitive visual feedback so that's how xprof was born and yeah a bit more about why single function profiling it allows us to gather more data about about that single function, the duration of that, because very often there is like a fast pass and a slow pass of a function depending on its arguments. And looking at just the average actually hide this fact. So there can be like outliers which are completely take a lot of time. And then if there is one user who gets a very long response on it, the website, he will be quite unsatisfied just because the average is good. So it's very important to observe the high percentiles and the maximum values when you look at a live system. So uh, how does XProf look like? So you include this library in your uh, release. You can start it when you have some problems. Uh, uh, go to the web interface. Up in that uh, query text box, you can type the module function 
that you, you want to measure, like one, and then you get this nice graph. On the right-hand side, there is the call count. On the left-hand side, there is the durations, and then you get like minimum, maximum, average, percentile values you can show and hide them. I th think you can see that uh, this function is uh, called 200 times per second. That's on the right scale. And it takes like, I don't know, 100 milliseconds, 160 milliseconds. And you, you can, we also have something like uh, m capturing long calls. So you can set a threshold. Let's capture calls that take longer than 120 milliseconds. And let's just capture three samples of them. And then you get a list of how long they took, the, which process executed them, and then what arguments it were called, and what was the return value. And then we, we can spot some patterns. The first argument is always the atom long. So from the arguments, from the samples, we can like get some intuition that hmm, maybe it's related. If it's long, then the first argument is long. So let's do some additional filtering. We can even do that, measure the function when the first argument is not the atom long. We don't know what value it can be. Just uh, check that out. Yeah, we can see now that on the right hand side that there are about 100 uh, such calls and the duration is much shorter. So let's capture again some samples. Again, three samples. And now we can see that the first argument is short. So now we can definitely see that there is some relation. And we this way explored we, how, what kind of arguments this function is called. We can also measure private functions. So now I select like the nap long and the nap short private functions. So you can also measure multiple functions at a time. And then, yeah, if it fits on your monitor, then you can like compare how, which one is the slower or if there is a spike, there is a correlation. If the one is slow, the other is slow or things like that. So that's a different kind of pro profiling, which is more interactive. But uh, let's look at first uh, tracing. The Erlang VM has this great uh, hidden feature, which, uh, which uh, gives some basic tooling to, for other tools to build upon. So how that works, you can specify like a set of processes and a set of functions that you want to trace. And then the intersection will get traced, which means that an Elixir message will be sent to a tracer process, which is in currently an XProf tracer process. So you can specify one process that you want to trace, or all the processes in the system, or only the existing processes, or only the new processes will be spawned later. And in the uh, pattern uh, part, you can specify exactly like module function RT or module function with all arities or all functions from a module. And additionally, you can specify something like the match spec, match spec which is all to narrow down it further. In, in XProf, it, only a subset of this is supported. So you can only select all the processes or none of them. This uh, relates to that big green button on the XProf UI. So that's a big on-off switch. So you, you can turn on and off tracing. And then um, the function, you can specify it in the text box. So what are mesh specs? Um, they are these horrible terms that you can see. They are uh, hardly un understandable. Or if you still understand, you probably make a mistake in them. So it's better to look at them like an anonymous function, which, which serves to, to filter. Um, the functions that are traced. So they have like, a, like as a function has a head, a guard, and body. And on, uh, the match pack also have a match pack head, a match pack guards, and match pack body. Uh, they, have, they are used in two places in the Erlang VM. One is for ETS tables, and one is for, for tracing. They have a slightly different uh, flavors. So ETS, you might have met the, that, met with that with, with in registry. So the difference between the two flavors is first the ETS one receives a tuple, which is like one object or one row in an ETS table, 
whereas the DBG flavor receives the list of arguments the function was called with. And then in ETS flavor, the return value is actually the result of the selection. And in tracing, the return value is ignored. It's only executed for its, for its side effects to modify in various ways the behavior of tracing. The body is very limited. It cannot be like a normal function. You cannot do function calls there. You cannot do conditions like if or case. You cannot do matching there. It, most of it is like term construction and something like guards. Plus, in DBG, you can also add some th these action functions, which look like local function calls, but actually they are not. <laughs> but let's see some examples and how they look like, what, what format you can put in, in that XPROF uh, query text box. You can put the module functionality, that's, that's fine, and then module function followed by something which is something like the part of an anonymous function. So one example, when you only filter on the arguments, like let's measure the registry lookup cause when it is called only on the myapp.registry. So all other registries we don't care about. That's already very useful. But you can even add guards, so only measure registry dispatch calls when it's called on topic one or topic two. So with the guards, you can match on, any, on multiple values as well. And here is the body part. The, the most important action function is the message, which modifies actually the trace message, which is sent on the low level. On XPROF level, it doesn't have any effect when you just look at the graph. It only has an effect when you actually capture the arguments. And then instead of the arguments, it will show what you put in the message. So you can actually change what you want to see. And that's very useful because this way you can reuse some noise and really look at what you want to. For in this example, you can like uh, capture who called the enummap function when it took like l too long. Because enummap is like a library function, it's called million places. So it's good to identify where it is called. The other most common part is when you want to only capture like part of the arguments or some derived value from the arguments. In the first example, you can, uh, so there are, you measure ETS insert uh, calls, inserting some data into the data table, and then you capture the second field of the data structure, which can be a possibly a huge tuple with all kind of non-interesting parts but you, you want to see the second field. And that, that's not just useful to, to reduce noise, so you can actually see what you want. You don't have to search in a big tuple, like which is the interesting part, but also it reduces overhead, because the overhead of tracing consists of sending messages and copying terms. And if the arguments of a function are large, large terms have to be copied from one process to the other. And in live system, it's very important to try to reduce the overhead and the impact as much as possible. And then the other example is like uh, measuring enum match when it enum fetch when it is called with a list, and then only capture the length of the list because we don't care about the elements; we only care about how long <laughs> list it is usually called with. And then the most complex example. This sampling implemented with mass specification, so we can see how powerful mass specs are. There is something called the trace control word in the Erlang VM, which is like a global integer, which can be read and uh, written both from mass specs and also from Elixir code. So this, this mass spec will just capture every tense uh, function call. So this is like a down sampling. So if and map is called, I don't know, 100,000 times, it will only capture 10,000 uh, calls of that, but on the statistical level, you can still get a good uh, samples. So how does that work exactly? So the first function close or match pack close 
it checks if the control word is nine or above, and then it resets it to zero, and then does the default behavior, which is to do the actual tracing. And otherwise, it increments this counter by one, but uh, this message force will basically silence this call, so there will be no trace message generated. That's very smart. <laughs> So if you want to really dig into mass specs, which I strongly advise, you can look at the Erlang uh, reference manual to, to like, investigate what, what kind of um, these action functions are allowed. There are a few more of them. Also, there are some re uh, about the restrictions of the body. You can find some description in this MS transform documentation. And then finally, we created a, or started a wiki page or some mass specs where we, everybody can edit it. So we would like to try to gather like useful or tricky patterns that others can use as well. Currently, it only contains these examples that I showed, but I hope it will grow day by day. And then let's see some real world examples. The first one is the original one, which I called fat request. So the system we, we've seen like increased response times and general slowness. And so how that worked is before uh, the processing of the request, there is a preparation phase which, where we fetch all kind of configuration data for that object from ETS, so from memory. It should be very, very fast. But actually, as it turned out, some objects had huge configuration. So that's what we saw. So this is the preparation phase. We can get some impression that there are about 200 calls per second, 200 requests. Um, the average is down there be below 50 milliseconds or maybe even less to 10 milliseconds. But actually, the 95th and 99th percentiles are above 300 milliseconds, so it's, it's horrible. It shouldn't be like that. And then, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a screenshot from two years ago, but we did capture some samples, and then we've seen that actually which objects are which have huge configurations and which part of the configuration is huge, which was very useful because we could go to that team who configures these things that, come on, here you go, you configure these huge things. And also we could tell the technical management that this problem actually occurs quite often. So like every second there is a few such requests. So we need to do something about it. We have to fix this. Other example, it, it's, it wasn't a performance issue, although it looks like. So what we've seen in the monitoring system that um, the maximum uh, load balancer latency was sometimes spiking to five seconds. So I, I started to use XProf to go down from the handle request function and go deeper and deeper. And then I, at some level, I found that there are some uh, MySQL uh, queries. So first on the graph, it was visible like how often this happens. So it happens like not even even every second, like a few times in a minute. And it is also visible that all the requests take five seconds. So you, you can see like the pattern, like how the system behaves. And then um, capturing some samples, it was visible that all of them returned an error connection lock timeout, which looking at the code, it meant that there is no free connection in the connection pool, so the request couldn't even be sent on the wire. So after expanding the, re resizing the pool, the problem went away. We can see that the, the request time went back to normal, like a few milliseconds. But this is generally very useful when, uh, not just when you have like this duration related performance issues, but um, when you try to find out what the function returns, maybe it returns some error, you want to capture it and you can use it without like printf debugging. So you can just uh, turn on xprofing on that function. And first you look at the graph so you can have an impression like how often it is called or is it safe to, to, to capture some samples or what threshold should I set to capture some samples? Actually, you can even set zero milliseconds and then you capture all the messages. So then it works as regular tracing like recon or 
extra tap or these kind of tools. And after you've seen the big picture, you can zoom in and, and see actual the return values and uh, arguments, which, which give you some impression like exactly what's happening. So this is kind of the general workflow. You, you don't start with XROF, you start with some monitoring system, where then you get some alert or you spot some spike. When there is a issue, so you fire up XProf and then you uh, try to trace some functions. You, you go usually top down and uh, also check your source code, like what functions are called. called. You can compare two functions, which one is the slow or which one is the problematic. You can use some match specifications to narrow down your search and then iterate deeper and deeper until you find the issue. So uh, summing up, <laughs> um, tracing itself is a great tool to use uh, non-intrusive debugging on, on live systems. XProf adds some nice uh, uh, features like visual feedback, uh, safety, overload protection, and uh, it has versatile usages. So, so please try XProf, give feedback. Uh, if you have issues, uh, send some GitHub issues or even contribute. It's available as a hex package and sources on GitHub. So pretty much that's it about XROF and <laughs> thanks for listening. Thank you. Any questions? Hey. Yeah, hey. I'm not sure. Maybe you've, you've mentioned that, but uh, w uh, what's the security of this? So you, you integrate it with your, say, web app, and then you you've got a port number that you access it, and is it protected? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So it is not protected. It is kind of outside the scope scope of this tool. So you can you should put it behind some VPN or some like nginx or something. And you definitely should do that if you're running it on a web application which has actually exposed ports. Yeah, so <laughs> you should take care of that. Thank Thanks. You. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, that was a great talk, really interesting. Do you do anything for proactive alerting, um, sort of monitoring thresholds and pinging anything? Yeah, no. So, so XProf is like a second level. So you should have your regular monitoring system in place and alarms. And this is only like for ad hoc debugging when you see there is some issue, but you don't see the details. So then you turn on XProf and do some investigation. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Oh. Do you have any way to look at um, pieces of data that take a lot, amount, uh, a large amount of memory in the um, in the system? Yeah, I think we will need another tool for that. So this is more for for like function calls and this functional aspects and that part of the runtime. Yeah. So there are other tools like Web Server which can show like which is the process which has the highest memory or which is the ETS table, which is the largest. So this requires some other kind of analysis. Yeah. I'm just wondering what you use for your regular monitoring. Sorry, what kind uh, of... What do you use for your regular monitoring at yeah. uh, the top level? Yeah, so in this example, we use Datadog, but or we used Graphite or... Yeah, there are a couple of other options. I know there is UpSignal or Prime, which are Elixir specific, like performance monitoring systems. Thank you. Last one. Yeah, um, I was actually wondering whether it would be possible to um, send the metrics to something like Graphite or an external tools when you capture them with XProf. Mm -hmm. So, so to send the, the graph it, or or the actual trace messages, of the, 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 
metrics you capture, so the numbers, for example, uh -huh, execution uh -huh, time. Okay. Yeah, so actually, so we are actually in the process of splitting XProf into two parts. The, the UI part, which is just the web interface with your cowboy server, and, and the XProf core, which then would have like an Erlang or, uh, Erlang or Elixir API to export the, the raw data, which can then with some cost, like a, with the gen server or some SASD integration, it could export the, the data. But actually the use case for XProf is it, it's not running all the time, unlike some monitoring system. It's rather you just fire it up the data that you see is only in a one, win, one minute window, and then it's forgotten. So it's, it's pretty much for live investigation. So you, you, you usually don't want to have it on day and night, just, for, just to be sure, like, just for safety of the production system. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.